All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dion Rossiter, and I am the Executive Director of Science at Cal. It's so great to have you here for our final Midday Science Cafe of the summer. Uh, we're bringing you the periodic table, how the basic elements of life are advancing the frontiers of research with Dr. Eva G and Dr. Kathy Shield. So, I want to start as I start all of our midday cafes uh, with a land acknowledgement. Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land has and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Every, uh, oh, this land was, oh, excuse me, I got lost with my bullet points. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you so much for allowing me the time to make that land acknowledgement. I'll just go ahead and quickly introduce uh, Science at Cal. We really bring the wonder and the excitement of UC Berkeley STEM and research community. Uh, all of our events and programs are free and geared towards public audiences. I hope that you've joined us for our events previously. If you haven't, welcome for the first time. Um, we're really a, a big part of the East Bay community because we not just host events like lectures and cafes and festival. We're really in the community out, off campus uh, and we, we partner with different groups like consulates and libraries, and we go to First Fridays and farmers markets. So we're really community centered. So we'd like for you to stay tuned again for some of our programming. Um, oh, excuse me, I switched too fast. So some of our programming, we've been around since 2008, and we really, really wanna highlight researchers in our community and bring them to the public. Before I hand things over to Jen to talk a little bit about Berkeley Lab, I wanted to also mention that you can see from your Zoom functions that there is both a Q&A box and a chat box. Feel free to ask questions in either one of these mechanisms. Also, you are um, there is closed captioning available. So either you'll see a closed captioning button, or there's like three dot buttons. You can click more, and it'll you can uh, click show subtitles. So either way, you are able to uh, to do that. And another thing is that this event is being recorded. So I want to remind you that uh, we will send this recording out to all of you who are here today, to anyone who RSVP'd. Um, so again, thank you so much. And if you're interested in watching this again or forwarding it on to a friend who couldn't make it, um, you can do that. So at this point, I'm gonna hand things over to Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab. Awesome, thanks so much, Dee. Uh, as Dee said, I'm Jen Tang. I'm the Director of Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about the lab, which is one of 17 US Department of Energy National Laboratories across the country. We're supported by the DOE Office of Science and managed by the University of California. And all of our research we conduct is unclassified. Since the lab's founding back in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. Now today, Berkeley Lab researchers develop sustainable energy and environmental solutions. They create useful new materials, advance the frontiers of advanced computing, and probe the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe. Our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills above the UC Berkeley campus, and we employ about 4,000 people, about 1,700 of whom are scientists, engineers, and faculty members. And more than 500 of our employees are undergraduate and graduate students, scientists who are just beginning their research journey. Now, the lab's proximity to Cal and our close ties to the UC system create a unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. A number of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or professors, many of whom have joint appointments at the lab. And as you can imagine, Berkeley Lab's relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close, 
and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating Midday Science Cafe uh, is to actually share with you examples of compelling and complementary research from both of our institutions, and we hope you enjoy today's presentation on the periodic table. With that, let me turn it back to Dee so we can get our program started. Thank you so much, and I think I thought there was a stay tuned, which is why I'm a little thrown off because I wanted to say to everyone, there it was, somehow we missed it. <laughs> yes, there was that stay tuned for everyone um, that we will have programming in the fall. So yes, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Eva G. She was born and grew up in upstate Ithaca, New York. She stayed in her hometown for college majoring in chemistry at Cornell University and conducting undergraduate research with professor, uh, professor excuse me, Yimun Ye A. After graduating with her BA in 2013, she moved on to complete her PhD in chemistry in 2019 at Princeton University, conducting research in the lab of professor, professor Tom Muir. I don't know why professor is a hard word for me today. Her thesis work utilized protein chemistry tools in this to study uh, chromatin biology. After her PhD, she swapped coast and started her postdoc at UC Berkeley in the fall of 2019 in the lab of Professor Chris Chang. In the Chang lab, she is interested in how copper interacts with proteins to impact cell signaling pathways. And you'll learn more about what that means in just a second. Outside of the lab, Eva loves to read and cook, and she is passionate about teaching, especially non-traditional students with experience teaching inside prisons during her PhD work. So we are incredibly excited to have Eva here, and I will let you take it away, Eva. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve, for that introduction. Um, so for today's periodic table talk, I'm gonna be focusing on metals in biology and specifically some work I've been doing studying uh, copper in biology. So uh, we as chemists like to think of the periodic table as the building blocks for life. Um, specifically, when you think of uh, biology, you might think of these four elements. So hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, and this is especially reflected in the structure of various biomolecules. So here is an example of a lipid, so a fatty molecule. Um, this is cholesterol. And if you look, oops. Uh, you can see here hydrogens and oxygens, and then um, in these chemical structure notations, the intersection of two lines actually represents a carbon, so this has many carbons. Um, another example is the DNA building block adenosine. Again, you see a lot of nitrogens, oxygens, carbons, and hydrogens. And finally, um, this molecule here, which is the protein building block arginine. Again, you see a lot of these particular four elements. However, outside of these elements, metals are actually essential for life as well. And this is reflected in um, all organisms, starting from the most basic, such as a bacteria, including E. coli. So E. coli utilize magnesium for their DNA structure um, to stabilize their DNA structure, and they utilize iron to um, for electron transfer and for metabolism. If you move up one degree of complexity, you get organisms such as uh, yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and yeast use calcium as a second messenger for cell signaling, and they use both magnesium and zinc to stabilize their chromatin structure, their genetic information. And finally, if you move up to a much more complex multicellular organisms such as us, um, humans or homo sapiens, we use iron in our blood to transfer oxygen, we use calcium to build strong bones and teeth, and we use uh, sodium and potassium for neuronal signaling in our brains. So a lot of the metals that we use are actually in what are known as metalloproteins. So metalloproteins are the many proteins that rely on metals to do their jobs. It turns out that one half to two thirds of all proteins actually utilize a metal. One example of this is hemoglobin, um, which uses iron to carry oxygen in our bloodstreams. So how this works is we consume iron in our diets, and then um, 
the iron shown here actually directly binds oxygen and moves around in our bloodstream to transport that oxygen. So here is a crystal structure of the hemoglobin protein. So a crystal structure is essentially a static snapshot of what that protein looks like rendered in cartoon form. And if you zoom in, uh, you'll see that the iron is bound in this structure here. The iron is the kind of orange colored globe, and we can represent it as this particular chemical structure on the right here. So, uh, Metals are also used in medicine. Um, as I just mentioned, because so many proteins rely on metals, many drugs target this essential interaction between the protein and the metal. One example of this is the drug acetazolamide, uh, which targets a protein called carbonic anhydrase. And this drug, um, by targeting this protein, is able to control the blood acidity. If we zoom in to the metal binding site, which is a cobalt binding site of this carbonic anhydrase protein, um, we can see in this little stick figure here that the drug binds right next to the metal binding site. So other, drug, uh, other drugs target not the protein metal interaction, but actually utilize metals themselves. One example of this is cisplatin, which is a cancer drug. So cisplatin has this platinum at the center of the molecule and uh, this drug is able to insert itself in between DNA base pairs to prevent DNA replication, which is needed for cancer cells to, uh, to divide. So in the Chang lab, we're especially interested in studying the transition metals. So back to the periodic table, um, these here are the transition metals. So five of the 10 first row transition metals are essential to human health. These metals are consumed in a varied diet or as nutritional supplements. So if you've ever read the side of a cereal box, you'll notice that uh, there are actually a lot of metals added in as nutritional supplements. So normal uh, bodily function requires that the levels of these metal ions are maintained within a fairly narrow acceptable range. If you don't get enough, that's considered a nutritional deficiency. And if you have too much metals, that could result in toxicity. So specifically, the metal that I study is copper, which is one of these essential nutrients. The World Health Organization recommends that adults ingest a minimum amount of 1.3 milligrams a day of copper. So sources of copper in the diet include um, shellfish, whole grains, beans, nuts, leafy greens, dried fruits, cocoa, and black pepper. So copper homeostasis or copper balance in the body is extremely important. And when that balance is disrupted, you get the development of disease states. So one example of this is Wilson's disease, which is a genetic disorder that causes copper buildup in the liver. So this copper buildup can cause liver toxicity as well as neurologic and psychiatric symptoms. Um, Wilson's disease can be often uh, diagnosed by observing this copper colored ring around the eye. If you guys watch the TV show House, uh, there was an episode where a patient had Wilson's disease and they diagnosed it by looking at his eyes. So um, the reason why we're interested in studying copper is that a better understanding of how our bodies utilize copper will expand our knowledge of human biology and therefore how to treat diseases that, are, uh, that arise when uh, this copper balance is thrown off. So um, before I get into my project, I need to introduce the concept of signaling pathways. So signaling pathways uh, control many biological processes. In this cartoon cell on the left, um, a signal binds a receptor and starts this pathway that leads to a response. You can kind of think of it as a phone tree uh, where the first person receives a message and they have to relay that message onto, um, the, diff onto the onto more people and then more people so that at the end, everyone gets this message and then you can um, do some sort of proper response. So cellular signaling involves the relay of messages that lead to a response in a cell. And these messages are passed on by the physical interaction of chemical signals and receptors that are often proteins. So some examples of signals include the neurotransmitter serotonin, uh, the drug acetazolamide, which I talked about on an earlier slide, and also metal ions such as copper. Some examples of responses are increased feelings of happiness from serotonin release, uh, changes in blood pH when this drug acetazolamide inhibits the protein carbonic anhydrase, 
and increase fat burning in a process called lipolysis in response to copper metal ions. So um, earlier postdocs in the Chang lab started this project and, um, and discovered that copper can promote fat breakdown in mice. So here are stains of liver tissue um, or slides of liver tissue where the fats, the lipids are uh, these little red globules, these little red dots that you can see in these slides. So in a normal mouse, um, the liver is able to get rid of copper as it needs to and you see these healthy amounts of fat, like you see more fat. However, if the liver cannot properly get rid of uh, copper, you get a buildup of copper and you actually see more fat burning. So in the copper rich mouse um, that's unable to remove copper, you see increased fat burning. So further studies narrow this down um, to reveal that copper binds to a particular protein, an enzyme called PDE3B, and is able to regulate lipolysis or fat metabolism by inhibiting this protein. So here's a piece of data where on the y-axis, you see the overall activity um, of this protein. And then on the x-axis, we are titrating in or we are adding in increasing equivalents of copper. And you see that the more copper you add in, the less active your protein is. So um, when I picked up this project, I wanted to ask two main questions. So first, where on this protein does copper bind? And second, how does copper binding inhibit the protein activity? So to explain to you why that's important, I want you to think of enzymes as molecular machines. So enzymes are proteins that perform specific chemical reactions. Um, one machine that we're all familiar with is a toaster. So if we ask the question, what does the machine do? What reaction does it perform? We know a toaster converts a starting material of bread into a product of toast. So this protein that I'm studying, PDE3B, the, uh, the reaction that it does is to break down a particular molecule called CAMP. Next, we might ask, um, can anything change how well the machine works? So if we wanted to inhibit the toaster, we could jam a spatula in it, and then you wouldn't get your, your reaction, your conversion of bread to toast anymore. Um, and for my protein, PDE3B, we know that copper is an inhibitor. So next, we would want to ask, what is the machine structure? So by looking at the structure of a toaster, it tells us a lot of things. So where does the reaction occur? It occurs um, where you have the bread shaped slots, and also where does the inhibitor bind? So these are, uh, parts, these are some of the questions that I'm still trying to answer about this PDE3B enzyme. So um, the point of this is that a better understanding of the structure and function of the machine, in my case, the enzyme PDE3B, allows us to tune its function and also the, process, the processes that it regulates. So in this case, lipolysis or fat burning. So now I'm gonna go into some of the tools I use and some of the experiments I do to study PDE3B. Uh, these are not just limited to this one protein. They can also be used to study other metalloproteins uh, or more proteins generally. So first, X-ray crystallography can provide a molecular snapshot of protein structure. So under certain chemical conditions, proteins will form crystals that look like this. Uh, you can think of them almost as like tiny clear gemstones. And when you shoot X-rays at these crystals, um, you can then solve for a structure that you can render in this cartoon form, such as the one shown here. So luckily, um, my protein that I'm studying, PDE3B, has actually been crystallized before. Unfortunately, that structure didn't contain copper. So um, we're not sure exactly where copper binds given the structure. Currently, I'm working on obtaining a new crystal structure of this protein with copper bound. So we'll be able to see exactly where copper sits within this protein structure. Additionally, I also use biochemical assays to um, assess enzyme behavior under different conditions. So what I mean by an assay is an assay is an in vitro or test tube reaction. So in this reaction, we have very simplified components. In the test tube, we just put the enzyme, which is PDE3B, its starting material, which is the CAMP molecule, and then copper, which is the inhibitor. And by varying the concentration of the reaction components, it allows us to study the properties of the enzyme. So I do these assays in an oxygen-free glove box environment shown here. So all of my reactions are performed in this glove box here uh, because copper is actually sensitive to oxygen and I want to uh, prevent oxygen from interfering with my reactions. 
So one example of an assay is this competition reaction. So the point of this experiment is to ask how tightly does the copper bind to the PDE3B protein? So I can start off with a sample of the PDE3B bound to copper, and then I can slowly add in increasing amounts of a competitor. So another molecule or another protein that we know will bind copper. And uh, by gradually adding in a competitor that can also bind copper, um, it'll steal copper away from the PDE3B. And by slowly dosing in this competitor, we can generate this um, mathematical curve from which we can uh, calculate the precise binding affinity of my protein to copper. So finally, another technique I use is called mass spectrometry or mass spec for short. And mass spec uses changes in the mass of a protein as a proxy for protein state. So this is a picture of the mass spectrometer that I use. Um, the sample is loaded right here on this stage. And, oh, wow, this is loading very slowly. Um, here, okay, so this is an example of the kind of data I can collect where each individual pixel is actually one spectrum that corresponds to one collected mass for one protein fragment. And as you can see with all these pixels, we're able to generate a lot of data um, to tell us how our protein kind of changes in different environments. So today I've talked to you about one project looking at how copper promotes fat metabolism by inhibiting the enzyme PDE3B. But it turns out that copper can actually bind many proteins and, in, and is involved in numerous signaling pathways. So some of them are shown here. These pathways control um, a variety of biological processes, including cell growth and proliferation. So proliferation is the process of cells not just growing, but multiplying. Um, a process called autophagy, which uh, cells use to engulf nutrients and also cell death. So finally, um, I'd like to thank you for being a great audience. Um, and then also my advisor, Professor Chris Chang, the members of the Chang Lab, um, some former members, some collaborators, both at Berkeley and at other institutions. And I'll leave you with this picture of the Chang Lab in Hawaii um, just a couple months before COVID hit in the before time. So yeah, I'm, I'd be happy to... Uh, I, I guess questions are later maybe, but. We're gonna ask you a few questions right now. Oh. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Um, so we have one question. So I know that you talked a lot, I mean, really all about copper, right? This is such a, a fascinating element. And we do, we know that we get it from our diet, but why can't we just, you know, eat like a pure copper penny, for example, or drink out of cap copper cups? Um, so that we're getting, it, as opposed to eating it through, through food. Yeah, so copper exists in uh, different chemical forms. Um, as a pure metal, copper is uncharged, and that's what you see in copper pennies or copper cups. Um, but the type that we can use as nutrition is actually a soluble form um, where copper needs to have one or two electrons taken away from it. So unfortunately, the metallic copper that we see in a lot of objects isn't the, the form of copper that our bodies can actually utilize. Um, the type that our bodies can utilize, luckily, is found in a lot of consumables, so food. Uh, that makes sense. So different forms of copper, some are digestible, some are not. Excellent. Okay. So how is studying copper then different from studying other metals in biology? It seems very special here. So what makes it so? Yeah. So each element in the periodic table has different chemical properties due to the number of electrons it has. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, for one example, copper is, um, has different states that can be sensitive to oxygen, so I have to work in the specific love box environment. Uh, some other proteins, such as calcium um, or sodium, are not air sensitive, so we can just work with them on the bench top. Uh, other metals, as the next speaker will actually talk about snake preview, are radioactive, so you have to take uh, special precautions in handling them. So each metal is really different due to its own chemical properties, and a lot of them are similar in a lot of ways, but uh, also different. Excellent. Thank you so much. So at this point, you can actually stop sharing, and I'm going to hand things over to Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab. Thank, Thank you, so Eva. Much. Oh. <laughs>
Thanks, Eva. Great presentation. Uh, it is now my pleasure to invite our next speaker to the screen, Kathy Shield, who is a researcher in Berkeley Labs Heavy Element Chemistry Group. And just last week, Kathy completed her PhD program with the Nuclear Engineering Department at UC Berkeley. So congratulations, Kathy, on that significant milestone. Uh, Kathy's work explores the fundamental uh, chemical characteristics of highly radioactive elements, including berkelium and californium, which were both discovered at Berkeley Lab. And her work with einsteinium, which is element 99, has been published in the journal Nature and featured in the New York Times. Outside of her research, she's active in the National Science Policy Network and trains grad students and postdocs in STEM to develop policy advising and advocacy skills. This fall, Kathy will actually be transitioning away from the research bench and will become a foreign service officer in the State Department. In her spare time, she's an avid hiker and skier and can often be found in the mountains with her dog, Adam. Dr. Shield, over to you. Thanks, Jen. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit more generally about the F elements and some of the fun things that we can do with them. Um, so as Eva kind of went through, um, this is the periodic table. I think we're all probably familiar with it at this point. Um, these elements here highlighted in green are the F elements. Um, and they are more specifically the lanthanides, which is the top row. Um, and the, those are named after lanthanum, the first element in that series, and the actinides, which is the bottom row, named after actinium. And you'll notice that these two lines are kind of popped out the bottom of the periodic table. And that's because if we actually put the periodic table the way that it should be shaped, it would look like this, and it would be very difficult to actually print it in our textbooks. So instead, we pop these two lines out underneath, um, and it's a little bit confusing, but that's OK. Um, why are these green elements called the F elements? They're called the F elements because they have electrons in, or, in F orbitals. So you might remember, or you might not from high school, um, electron orbitals. And these are different shapes, and they are where they basically tell us where the electrons are in an atom. And as we get into bigger and bigger atoms later and later in the periodic table, we have um, bigger orbitals. The electrons are moving around faster, and they start to approach the speed of light. And as we get to um, electrons moving that fast, we start to experience relativistic effects, um, which is because the electrons are moving so quickly. And they start to really mess with some of the chemistry. And this is something that we, um, as a field of F element chemists, are still studying a lot. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that, as Eva mentioned, a lot of the F elements are radioactive. And in fact, all of the F elements have at least one radioactive isotope. So what is radioactivity? Essentially, radioactivity is when an element is decaying and a nucleus decays into another. Now, radioactivity is based on the nuclear properties, not the electron properties. Um, and the electrons kind of define the chemistry. Um, but when one nucleus decays into another, there is some emission of particles or energy, um, usually alpha, beta, gamma, or neutrons. Um, and we can actually measure the specific energy of the, of the particles that are being emitted. And that helps us actually identify what elements or what isotopes specifically we're looking at. So I've shown here on the left-hand side a decay chain of actinium-227, which is an, an element that I work with a lot. Um, and you can maybe kind of see that actinium here decays to both thorium and to francium. And both thorium and francium themselves are radioactive. We've got all of this kind of chain of decays until everything kind of ends up at lead 207, which is stable and is no longer going to decay. And another important um, kind of decay chain that we work with a lot in our lab is berkelium 249, which decays into californium 249. And one of the things we have to think about when we're doing our chemistry is what are what elements are we working on? What are they decaying into? And how does the chemistry of those daughter products, what what things decay into, how does that chemistry affect the chemistry that we're trying to do? 
Eva kind of mentioned that we have to consider the safety of radioactivity. And so when we're working with radioactive materials, we do consider the hazard of radioactivity, just like we consider explosive hazards, or if you're working with lasers, you consider that hazard, or cryogenic stuff that's really cold. So when we're working with radioactive materials, one of the big things we do is we stay far away from the material as we can. We limit the time that we're working with the material and we use appropriate shielding. For example, this is a picture here of one of our former undergrads, Matt, who's working behind a ledged glass um, as shielding to prevent some of the dose from getting to his body. We also monitor ourselves with detectors um, and also with what are called dosimeters, which basically just measure how much radiation we're exposed to so that we can keep track of that. And we use um, monitors to make sure that we don't have any radioactive material on our hands or feet or our bodies when we leave the lab to make sure that we're not bringing in radioactive contamination out into the rest of the world. And if anything at any time goes even a little bit wrong, we have the support of the incredible radiation protection group um, who will come and make sure that we're clean, that they'll help us clean something up if we make a mistake. Um, and generally they support all of our work and they're really excellent at their job. Um, so one thing that makes it possible for us to work with radioactive materials here at Berkeley Lab is that these elements were actually discovered at Berkeley Lab. And so this periodic table, I've highlighted in purple the 16 elements that were discovered here at Berkeley. Um, and a lot of them were discovered by Glenn Seaborg and his researchers. And Glenn Seaborg actually won the Nobel Prize for discovering elements. He also had an element, Seaborgium, named after him. And he said that having the element named after him was more important than getting the Nobel Prize, which I think is kind of funny. Um, a couple other researchers here at Berkeley that were really influential are Darlene Hoffman, who was one of the first women who was involved in an element discovery team, and James Harris, who was the first African-American chemist to work on and discover uh, new elements. So Eva kind of talked about, oh, I'm sorry. Um, when we're working in our group um, on these elements, we work with this molecule called HOPO. And like Eva mentioned, this is a Chon molecule, which means it's composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And this is actually a biologically inspired ligand. So we based it off of some molecules that, um, that bacteria um, and other, sorry, that, that bacteria in the body create for basically stealing iron from us. We, decide, we designed this molecule um, based on those for plutonium specifically in the event of some nuclear disaster so that we can get plutonium out of the body. But because of the properties of this molecule, we can actually do a lot to study the fundamental chemistry of the F elements. And so one thing that we do is we actually use the protein crystallography that Eva was talking about to take measurements on really tiny amounts of radioactive material. So what we can do is we can put some of our F elements, especially the actinides, inside um, this molecule HOPO, and then put that whole complex inside a protein, crystallize the protein, and by taking measurements of that protein crystal, get information about the fundamental bonding between HOPO, our molecule, and the F elements that we care about. The F elements are also really valuable in medical diagnostics and therapies. So for example, gadolinium is used as an MRI contrast agent to help doctors um, see abnormalities in the brain without, um, even without any radioactivity. And then there are radioactive elements that we use. For example, we use actinium as a targeted cancer therapy agent. Um, and so this picture in the bottom left shows the disappearance of cancer after treatment with actinium. And that's, we're able to target the radioactivity to the cancers without affecting as many of the other surrounding cells as chemotherapy might affect. And then we can also use, for example, cerium as it decays into lanthanum to do what's called positron emission tomography imaging. And that's where we're imaging a specific type of decay where positrons are emitted, and we can follow the metals as they go around, in this case, mice um, bodies, to track what exactly is happening between a, a metal that's complexed in the body. 
Another thing that we do with HOPO and with other molecules with the F elements is we look at the luminescence of these elements. And by um, looking at the luminescence, we can kind of glean some really valuable information about the electron structure of the elements and of the complexes. And in my opinion, create some of the coolest colors on the periodic table that unfortunately we are not allowed to use on Halloween as face paint. Um, a lot of my work has been with francium, which is the decay, one of the decay products of actinium that I showed earlier. And all isotopes of francium are radioactive and the longest lived isotope is 22 minutes. So that means that if I have some francium, 22 minutes later, I only have half as much francium as I started with. And because it decays so quickly, very little is known about francium's chemical behavior. So this plot that I'm showing here um, is actually just a measurement of the same sample of francium over the course of about two hours. And I've taken a bunch of measurements of the same sample, starting with these purple lines and decaying down over each measurement through the blue and the last measurements were these yellow lines. And as you can see, if we look at this um, figure, the area under these curves um, is the y-axis and the time basically between when I started counting and when I took each measurement is on the x-axis. And this decay shows me that I am actually looking at francium because it's got a 24 plus or minus two minute half-life, which is in line with the known half-life of 22 minutes. So once I was able to confirm that I had this clean source of francium, I could start to investigate some of the chemical properties of it. Um, Another pair of elements I mentioned earlier that we've been working with are berkelium and californium. And again, berkelium and californium are kind of the parent-daughter pairs. Berkelium decays into californium. But if we want to do fundamental chemistry with just berkelium or just californium, we need to separate them from each other. And so that's what this figure is showing, is using this column pictured here on the right, um, we can load a mixed berkelium californium solution into the top and basically elute or have it kind of come through the column and try to separate those two elements from each other. And so this plot shows um, on the x-axis the total amount of volume that I've put through the column and on the y-axis the percent of activity or the percent of the metal. And we can see that we've got a pretty decent separation of this purple curve, which is the berkelium, from the green curve, which is the Californium. And now ideally, this purple curve would be completely flat where the green curve, the Californium is coming out. And that's what I'm working on doing now. Um, but this separation allows us to measure, for example, some of the, mag the magnetic properties of these elements, um, make cool crystals, all sorts of fun science with each of these separately. We also have been working with the next element on the periodic table, which is Einsteinium. And about two years ago, we got a delivery of 50% of the world's Einsteinium, which seems like a lot, but it was only 250 nanograms. So if you imagine taking a grape and squishing it down to be the size of a grain of sand, and then squishing it down by that much again, that's about how much Einsteinium we had. And so it is clearly invisible, and we were actually tracking it just by using its radiation. Um, and so we can use a meter like this one that I've shown in the bottom left, kind of monitor is the activity over here or is the activity over here? So we know exactly where the Einsteinium that we're working with is. And even though we didn't have very much Einsteinium, we were able to take some measurements of an einsteinium hobo complex and found some unusual and unexpected characteristics so now we're looking forward in a few months to getting fermium even less, take that grain of sand and make it smaller and then make it smaller one more time. And that's about how much fermium we'll be getting. But hopefully we'll be able to take some measurements with the fermium that will tell us if Einsteinium is just weird or if Einsteinium is the beginning of maybe a new series or a new pattern uh, within the chemistry of the actinides. 
So that is a very brief overview of some of the chemistry and some of the research that we've been doing with the F elements here in Berkeley. I'd like to thank my department, the Nuclear Engineering Department at UC Berkeley, and my research group, the Bioactinide Chemistry Group here at Berkeley Lab, for being incredible people to work with. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was a really compelling presentation. We do have a couple of questions for you from the audience, and maybe we'll ask those before we bring uh, Eva and Dee back. So the first question we have for you is, so how do you get a hold of francium or Einsteinium, and how do you do that before it decays? Do you create it artificially since they aren't found in nature? Yeah, so I actually have a backup slide for this. So um, Einsteinium and fermium are produced at the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge National Lab. And so it's really great to be able to work with and collaborate with some of the other national labs in um, the Department of Energy complex. Um, and so this is a picture of the high flux isotope reactor, reactor. And essentially we put curium targets in one of these, you know, small circular kind of holes that you can see around the reactor. And there's just such a huge amount of neutrons that are flying around inside the reactor that the curium kind of absorbs the neutrons and then beta decays up the periodic table. So it gets to a, a later and later um, element. And so we can use that kind of technique to produce elements up to fermium Beyond fermium, um, they don't have long enough half-lives to be able to produce them somewhere else and then send them across the country for researchers to work with. And so there are actually, um, at a few labs around the world, researchers that produce um, their elements in cyclotrons and then study them immediately. Fascinating. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, one more question for you. We got a, uh, a question from our audience. What category are the elements tennessine and oganesson in? Yeah, so tennessine and oganesson are two of the most recently discovered and most recently named elements, and they're both super heavy elements. So um, if we say that the actinides or the F elements are not super well understood chemically and we don't have a lot of them to work with, super heavy elements are a whole nother category in terms of even shorter half-lives and even less material to work with. Um, but they're really cool. And there is a group at Berkeley Lab that's working on kind of understanding some of the properties of the super heavy elements because they don't necessarily follow kind of the patterns, the periodicity that the periodic table is, is named for. Got it. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen and invite Dee and Eva back to join us so we can start our question and answer session. Um, and folks, you're submitting fantastic questions. Keep them coming. We'll make sure to get to them during the Q&A. Uh, so let me actually start with a question for both of you. And maybe this is a bit of a softball question, but I'm guessing people might be curious. Uh, what is your favorite element and why? Maybe Eva will start with you. I actually think I know what Eva's going to say. Maybe she'll <laughs> surprise us. Maybe we should have said, besides <laughs> copper. <laughs> uh, that's a good no. point. Eva, Eva, you can say copper if you want to. Yeah, I actually like my brain kind of froze when you asked me. Um, I've certain, cer certainly been reading a lot about copper, so I've got a lot on my mind about how cool it is and why it's interesting. So I guess it's kind of the cheap answer for right now. I, I think a lot about how cool copper is. <laughs> And Kathy, what about you? Um, I think I have a kind of love-hate relationship with actinium. Um, it's really cool. Um, and I've spent a long time working with it. I think another really cool element on the periodic table is tungsten, which has the abbreviation W, which is confusing, but German's weird. Um, and I, I really like tungsten because it's the hardest um, element on the periodic table. Um, and if you ever, a lot of people get tungsten wedding rings, but if somehow your finger um, expands or your ring gets stuck, they can't cut it off. Okay. Wow. That is a fascinating, fascinating statistic. Good to know. Fun fact. <laughs> I love that having a love hate though. 
So I will go ahead and ask the next question. So this is a fun one. I mean, I, I was sort of curious when this person asked it too. Um, Eva, if you eat more copper, will you burn more fat? Um, in theory, yes, but it's also not that straightforward because as I mentioned, copper doesn't just bind this one protein to regulate this one pathway. It binds a bunch of proteins. So if you ate too much copper, it could throw off like a bunch of things, including how your cells divide, um, among, among others. So if you were to, so there's like a whole field of study about targeting certain drugs or targeting just certain compounds to one particular protein. So if you were to only, if you were to ingest copper and only send it to PDE3B, um, that might help fat burning without all these side effects of throwing off other biological processes. But uh, unfortunately we're not able to do that. <laughs> So it's complicated and there's a lot more going on than just this process, yes. So um, what if you drank uh, a somewhat acidic soda in a copper cup? Wouldn't that give you some trace level of a copper plus plus, CU plus plus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, acid does react with uh, metallic copper and you will solubilize copper. If anyone owns copper pans, like you might have heard the warning not to cook super acidic foods in them because you will actually leach copper out of the pan. Uh, so it's true, yeah, if you do drink um, acidic or consume acidic beverages or eat acidic items out of uh, copper containers, you, you will ingest copper that way, uh, like utilizable copper that way. Excellent. Jen, over to you. Thank you so much. All right, so Kathy, we've got a question for you. Um, considering how radioactive the actinides are, it's exciting to learn that I'm guessing AM is americium. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's exciting to learn that americium is found all over in smoke detectors. So why, why just americium? Are there other actinides used in everyday items? Yeah, so why americium? Americium is used in smoke detectors because it has kind of the ideal half-life. So I talked about really short half-lives like francium with 22 minutes or um, actinium-225, which is the that targeted cancer therapy agent, um, has a half-life of about 10 days. But there are also um, actinide isotopes that have half-lives of hundreds of thousands of years. And so americium is, a, is an ideal half-life for like use in smoke detectors because it's gonna decay for a long time, but it's not gonna decay forever. And then the reason that we don't need to be worried about americium um, being in our smoke detectors is it decays by alpha emission. And alpha particles can get stopped by a piece of paper, even a piece of tissue paper. And so because the americium is inside the smoke detector, um, it, the alpha particles aren't going to get outside of the smoke detector. And so there's no way for the radioactivity to like actually affect you unless you decided to take your smoke detector apart, which I would not recommend. Um, but I would recommend reading about a like 14 year old kid who did that um, and tried to make a nuclear reactor in his backyard. Okay, <laughs> duly noted. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy, you are full of all kinds of useful tips today. Fun facts about the F elements. That's why I'm here. Uh, so this question, I think, could be posed to both of you, um, and it relates to X-ray crystallography. So is there a way to examine conformational changes of proteins as a function of time, uh, for example, as a result of protein photocycles uh, using X-ray crystallography? That's all you, Eva. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I'm not a, an expert in protein crystallography, but it's kind of traditional use is to, um, so in order to get the protein crystal, you have to submit it to certain chemical conditions and then the crystal itself is actually frozen before you take the measurements. So because of that, um, the proteins are really only in one conformation and they're like locked in that conformation. There are a bunch of other tools that are used to study protein structure that, um, you can observe over time. So you can observe protein dynamics, including um, certain mass spec techniques, also NMR spectroscopy. Um, so techniques where the protein is in solution and able to move rather than kind of locked in a crystal. Um, but there might also be some X-ray uh, technologies that I don't know about. Got it. 
Um, so I'll ask one more and then B, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Kathy, do you think you might be able to use your nuclear expertise as a foreign service officer? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, on the surface, probably not really. There are um, a number of like nuclear energy programs that the State Department is working on with countries around the world that I'm hoping to be able to contribute to. Um, and, you know, there's probably um, some situations in which my nuclear expertise could be useful in, for example, negotiations with countries like Iran or in North Korea. Um, but generally, I am I'm moving into a position that will take advantage of some of the non-nuclear skills that I've learned in grad school in terms of data analysis and interacting and working with scientists from lots of different fields, but not necessarily nuclear science or radiochemistry specifically. Got it, thanks, that sounds exciting. Yeah, excellent, thank you. So um, Eva, you mentioned that the effect of copper um, activating fat metabolism, excuse me, was first discovered in mice, as you could see the differences in fat content in liver cells, correct? So how do you go from observing this phenomenon to narrowing it down to a single protein that seems so difficult? Yeah, so a lot of discoveries first come from an observation in an animal, often mice. So we do all sorts of things to mice. We restrict their diets, we give them drugs, and we see what happens. Um, so because uh, we because we know it's related to fat burning, um, scientists kind of have already narrowed down the individual like molecular and protein players in the signaling pathways that control fat burning. So that kind of gives us an idea of like which candidates to look at um, individually. And then uh, one of the discoveries from the mouse study was that mice accumulated the particular molecule CAMP. Um, which is something that you can measure as well. So normal, or so the mice with a lot of copper um, actually produce more of the CAMP molecule. And within the fat burning pathway, the protein that interacts with the CAMP is this PDE3B protein. So you kind of look at um, which proteins could be involved. You look at you know which molecules change uh, in the organism, and then you kind of cross reference everything. And that's how we got there. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so here's a question. Um, copper, copper deficiency is considered a, a, a low, it, it's low, right? It, there's not very many people who's, who are cough, copper deficient due to essentially right everything, a lot of things being fortified with copper and those sorts of things. Um, are there some groups who need more copper than others though? Um, yeah, so in an American diet, uh, it's pretty easy to get like nutritious foods that are rich in copper. So a lot of the copper deficiencies that we see are actually um, people who have genetic diseases that prevent them from absorbing copper or using copper. Um, so uh, not just copper, but all nutrients tend to be important for um, like pregnant women who just need a lot of nutrients in general or for growing children. Uh, so definitely those two populations. Oh, great. I'll ask one more question before I hand it over to Jen. Um, do we have any situations where copper displaces calcium in any biological systems? Yeah, so copper and calcium are chemically different enough that um, they're not interchangeable. But actually, um, the kind of copper that we use in cells is similar enough to, uh, to silver which we don't typically ingest, so, but it can be considered as like a toxin if we do, because it can substitute for copper where copper would normally need to be used, uh, but not, not calcium. You know, I just realized I didn't actually include a second part of the question that I had asked about copper deficiency. Mm -hmm. So I'll go back to that. What's the best way to know you're getting enough copper or unless we're a growing child, sorry, if you can hear sirens, I'm sorry. Um, unless we're a growing child or a pregnant woman, you know, do they get blood tests and things like that? Um, I'm actually not certain about the answer to that question. Mm. Uh, I guess in, in general, if you're like unhealthy, you would go to a doctor and they'd be able to figure out if it was like a nutritional deficiency. I don't know if 
Um, I, I, I know that like clinically copper deficiency presents certain symptoms, but uh, I don't okay. know the medical side of that. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> that's, that's fine. We don't expect you to know everything. <laughs> Eve, can I, can I hop in about the, the copper calcium question? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Go so this it. is, it's like sort of tangentially related, but in terms of um, in biological systems, calcium, like normal calcium pathways being kind of hijacked by other things. There are actually um, a set of bacteria, which under normal conditions would grow in the presence of calcium, but actually um, have mutated so that they grow in the presence of the lanthanides instead. Um, and that's really bizarre because calcium and the lanthanides are not typically considered chemically similar. Um, but that's just like an example of a biological system where like mother nature has done something really weird and we're trying to figure out what it is and why. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I will ask another question for you, Kathy. Um, we got a question about francium specifically. Can you talk a little bit about how you get a hold of francium before it decays? Do you, do you create that artificially as well? Yeah, so francium, I briefly mentioned, is the decay product of actinium. Um, and so depending on which isotope of actinium I have, I actually can get a different isotope of francium. And so what I do um, is I have actinium-227 um, and I load it onto a column, kind of similar to that one that I showed a picture of, um, but a little bit different. But I load it onto a column and then the actinium sticks and I can wash the francium off. So basically what I do is I wash all of the actinium daughters off of the column. So only the actinium is left there. And then I wait for about three hours and that's enough time for the francium to grow back in because it has such a short half-life. It like comes back really quickly. Um, and then I, but it's not enough time for all of the other decay products in that decay chain to really show up. And so then I can wash it again. And that second wash is pure francium. And that's the wash that I do chemistry with. So each time I'm doing like a francium experiment, um, not only do I only have like an hour after I actually get the francium, it takes about four hours of work to just get the francium to work with. That's incredible, thanks. Um, so a quick question for you again. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how about how positron emission detection is conducted using uh, the tomography methods you discussed earlier in your presentation? Yes, at a very high level. Um, so positron emission tomography um, is essentially, um, positron emission is a specific type of decay. Um, and so if you have the right types of isotopes that decay by positron emission, um, as that positron is emitted, it, you may know that a positron is kind of opposite of an electron. So it has very little mass, but it has a positive charge. Um, and when a positron and an electron um, interact, we see two um, basically gamma lines that come off directly opposite from each other. And so we put, in this case, the mice in the middle of like a ring of detectors. And those detectors can um, monitor when they see these gammas at exactly 180 degrees apart. And that's how you know that there was um, an event. And with um, like three-dimensional modeling that I am not capable of doing, but other people in my research do, um, you can kind of back out exactly the location in the middle of that ring of detectors that that emission um, occurred from. Got it, thanks so much. Uh, do you want me to ask one more or shall I uh, hand it over to you? Sure, ask one more. All right, so um, can you talk a little bit uh, about the periodic table and what might happen beyond element 118? You know, the, the periodic table currently ends at 118, but are scientists hunting for new elements? And if so, when might we see element 119 or 120? And where would they fit on the periodic table? Yeah, I think I'll take this one. Um, so there are researchers that are looking for elements beyond 118. Um, we expect that they will fall in like group one and group two, kind of a new row um, underneath the first couple columns of the periodic table. Um, depending on which like 
nuclear physicists you talk to, there's um, different numbers as to how many elements people think we might be able to produce. Um, but one thing that nuclear physicists are looking for when we're looking for new elements and new isotopes is what we call the island of stability. And so I talked about how as we get later in the periodic table, we get to shorter and shorter half-lives, and that's kind of a general trend. But there is pretty well um, established nuclear physics theory that says not too far beyond where we are now, we should find some isotopes which have longer half-lives back to the order of minutes or even hours instead of the super heavy elements right now are all like microseconds. Um, and so a lot of researchers are working on both trying to find new elements, um, but also trying to find new heavier isotopes to try to point us towards that island of stability. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, somebody asked, and I really appreciate this question. So there's two here. Um, I wonder if you both have, have paid attention throughout your careers at being uh, having good communication skills and being a good communicator. I know you both um, mentioned teaching um, and thinking about how we educate folks across, you know, from youth to the prisons. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on your just ability to communicate science and, and if that's if that is important to you and has been, how have you sort of taken steps to address that in, as a scientist? Both of you, that's a question for either of you to start. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I can start. Um, yeah, so I, I absolutely believe that science communication is essential. One of the biggest reasons is that all the research that we do um, in academic institutions tends to be publicly funded by the government. So funded by uh, government institutions such as the NIH and NSF and DOE that are funded by taxpayers. So really it's public money that allows us to do what we do. And I think therefore we have a responsibility to the public to be uh, to explain this is what your money is going towards. Um, this is how we're using your money to help you with the scientific discoveries. So that to me is a, is a huge uh, motivating factor. Yeah, I think um, Eva is definitely right, like right on point in terms of my motivation for sharing my science is that all of my science is funded by the you know, members of our country, our citizens. Um, and I think also I'm really passionate about working with scientists, not just communication in general, but communication with the people that help us get that funding and policymakers. Um, and I think when it comes to science communication, everybody is at least decent at communicating. Um, but generally, communication is not something that we're taught specifically in science. Um, we're not even taught how to communicate necessarily to other scientists, much less to people who have you know, technical backgrounds or non-technical backgrounds outside of our really minor field. Um, and so I, I do think that like learning to communicate is, is hard in science, but it's also something that if it's something you're committed to doing, there are lots and lots of resources and programs and people who are willing to help you out with that. Thank you. I, I love this question because I don't know if the folks in the audience know, but Jen and I work with our speakers time and time again to get these presentations really clear and accessible for everyone out there. So I appreciate that you all are taking notice that our presenters typically tend to be some really excellent and talented science communicators. So kudos to the presenters for all the hard work um, that they put in. So the other question that this person answered asked, which I also loved, and I was going to ask a version of this question was, could you share some experiences that might have attributed to your choice of chemistry as a career path. I know this event was marketed to a lot of young folks in who are interested in science. I'm sure we have some students out there. Could you just talk a little bit about how you kind of came to this either point in chemistry or engineering and were there any sort of major life or scholastic events that sort of helped you down this career path? 
I think for me, my love of chemistry started with a really excellent chemistry teacher in high school. Um, and my love of science even started before that with a really excellent science teacher in sixth grade. Um, and so I was really lucky that I had really awesome science teachers throughout like middle school and high school who encouraged me to learn more and like let me, you know, read, stick my nose in, in random books and answered all my weird questions. Um, I think that there are also lots of programs that are, especially for girls and young women um, who are interested in science, but maybe don't have that awesome chemistry teacher or an awesome biology teacher. Um, there are some programs, for example, that are hosted here at the lab that really support girls and women who wanna learn more about becoming scientists. Um, but I think generally for me, I'm pretty hard headed and I just kept taking classes that were interesting to me, even if people were like, are you sure you want to do that? Do you really want to become a nuclear engineer? And I was like, hmm, same school, so let's do it. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, you know, I'm actually loving the direction this conversation has gone. And I think, I, I think Eva was going to answer. Yeah, it. Oh, Eva didn't sorry, answer Eva. it. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm happy to chime in as well. So uh, I think maybe one of the, the more obvious things to me was that uh, my, my father is a scientist. He, he's actually a chemist. He was a chemist as well, although he was a physical chemist. So I don't, I still to this day can't understand what he did. Um, but I always grew up around, you know, like kind of understanding what science was and what scientists did. Um, I personally was more interested in kind of um, life and biology and health but I also knew that I, I wasn't interested in becoming a doctor and treating patients so and I but I really wanted to get at the fundamentals of those biology questions like why are we alive you know like what are the processes that keep us alive um all the cool biomedical research stuff so uh yeah yeah I I was also lucky to have um, a couple of really good chemistry teachers and professors so um and mentors along the way that were super encouraging and uh yeah, we're important. Great, thank you. So, you know, sort of along the lines of this conversation that we're having and you know, the education that you're all doing with students, we, we got a question from another uh, attendee who wanted to know if there are any programs that allow for collaborations uh, between students from different universities uh, through either Berkeley Lab or through Cal. I don't know if you guys might have any, uh, ha I don't know if you can answer that question, but thought I'd thought I'd put it out there since it looks like we've got a, a student in the audience who's also um, teaching as well. Yeah, I do not know the names of the programs off the top of my head, but there are programs both at the lab and like through the chemistry department at UC Berkeley for like visiting summer students from other universities. Um, so if you're a university student, that would definitely be something I would, I would look into. Um, I would also say that most professors and researchers are pretty open to getting invitations to collaborate or requests from students to come and work with them in their lab and, and learn about it. Um, so if there's a particular researcher at the lab or on campus whose research you think is really interesting um, and you've read a little bit about it, I would encourage you to email that professor. You can always find their email online. Um, send them an email, say, I'm interested in the work that you're doing. Can I talk to you or one of your current graduate students about what's going on um, and, and just learn more about what's happening in their lab? I think generally scientists are really excited to share the research that they're doing and they're never gonna turn down an opportunity to like bring a student into the fold. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, in the projects that I've been working on, I've been very lucky to have um, multiple collaborators. I, I, Berkeley feels like an especially collaborative environment. I've I've had times where I just walk down the hall or walk across the street to a different lab in a different building to use their instruments or ask someone a question. Um, like Kathy said, people are always happy to share their knowledge and their expertise. Um, individual labs tend to be fairly specialized. So if I'm working on a project and I was like, mm, my boss doesn't know that much about this technique, but this lab across the hall does. Um, it's very easy to email someone or get in contact with them. 
Um, if you are not part of Berkeley, um, but are interested, I would definitely say reach out to um, lab members or to um, professors by email. They are often open to collaborations or will tell you about any opportunities or openings they have in their labs. Fantastic. Thanks, Eva. And thanks, Kathy. Um, for those of you in the audience who are interested in science communication, I'm actually going to put a link in the chat. Uh, the Department of Energy's Office of Science is collaborating with the Kavli Foundation on ensuring that science communication is supported and effective. So uh, let me do that right now. It might be a good resource for folks. And, you know, I just also want to say, you know, we're getting close to a uh, close to 115. And, um, Thank you for the questions. We are now at the end of our event. Um, so before we close, I just wanna say thanks again to Kathy and to Eva for their fantastic presentations. And also thanks to the audience for tuning in and asking some really thought-provoking questions. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on research coming out of UC Berkeley, you can visit Science at Cal at scienceatcal.berkeley.edu. And you can visit Berkeley Lab at www.lbl.gov. With that, thanks again for joining us. Uh, this is the last summer uh, presentation for Midday Science Cafe, but stay tuned. We'll be sharing information about our fall lineup of speakers shortly. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.